Welcome to The Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle Podcast. Jamie Eads joining you as I do each and every week. This is episode 150. I hope everybody's having a great week out there in drum world. As always, we're having a great week here in Central Kentucky, headquarters of the Drum Shuffle Podcast. We have a great interview for you this week. I'm going to be joined by uh, a native of Belfast, Northern Ireland, who has made his home in Toronto, Canada for most of his life, the great Mark Kelso, right after this message from our sponsor, Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos Drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center, or heart, of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, as I mentioned before the break, we're going to be joined by the great Mark Kelso here in just a moment. Um, Mark and uh, his band, the Jazz Exiles, have a new record coming out uh, called The Dragon's Tale, and I have absolutely been wearing it out in my uh uh, rotation of new music. I really dig this record, but Mark and I had just a fantastic conversation, um, went a little bit longer than an hour. So I apologize if that messes up your commute. I hope not, but, uh, we just had so much to catch up on and talk about. Uh, he's just a wealth of information and, uh, you know, I was absolutely pleased to, to make his acquaintance and I think we're going to be friends for, a good long while. So please help me welcome to the Drum Shuffle podcast, Mark Kelso. Hey, good afternoon, Mark. How's it going, man? Hey, Jamie, I am doing great, sir. How about yourself? Uh, No complaints here. Uh, I get to spend an hour learning about you and your life, uh, and we get to talk drums. So what could I possibly complain about? <laughs> well, nothing, I guess. Talking drums is always good. <laughs> yeah, man, it's for sure it is. So, um for my crowd that may not be familiar, um let's yeah. let's kind of go back. I want to get some background information. Um born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, but you have called Canada home for most of your life, correct? Absolutely, yes, that is correct. Okay. So, let's let's delve into how this all happened what what was the happy accident that made you a drummer (laughs) well you know i i got it my roots always go back to my father sam who uh he played drums in what was known back in ireland as the show bands 
and he played in an Irish show band called The Witnesses. And um, he traveled around the world, uh, you know, doing shows because that was kind of the, the, the thing back then, you know, and, uh, and especially in Northern Ireland and around the rest of the country in, in the South, the show bands was a big circuit in the 60s and 70s for working musicians. And so he did that. And so obviously, as a small kid, I was always around him, you know, taking me to rehearsals and things. And he tells the story of the first time I got on the drum kit. He said I was probably about three or four. And, you know, he wasn't on the kit. He was talking to the other guys and they were playing something. And then all of a sudden he hears some time coming from the drums. He looks over and he sees that I've crawled up on the seat, got a stick in my hand, and I'm playing time with the band on the cymbal. And he's looking at that going, wait, is, is, is this just some sort of fluke or is he actually playing? And <laughs> typical dad, my dad typically says, stop, guys. Okay, change it to 3-4. And he said the guys played something in 3-4 and he said I stopped for a second and and then I, I, I kind of picked up on the three accent and started playing some time on the cymbal. And he's like, oh, all right. And the guys are all like, ah, oh, Sammy, your, your, your son, he's got, he's got the bug. He's going to be a drummer, right? So now fast forward, um, I think uh, I was about, uh, you know, eight, eight, eight-ish, sort of nine, nine, you know, around that area before we moved to Canada. And my dad had been to Canada at that, by that point. And, uh, you know, he came, him and my mother came home one day and they saw a military truck outside our house. And, and of course, um, we lived in a uh, mixed area for Catholics and Protestants. It was a new thing where they were trying to, you know, bridge the gap between the two cultures and the two people, trying to make everybody get along. And, you know, they freaked out. They're like, oh, my God, something terrible is happening. They ran into the house, and turns out the babysitter's boyfriend was in the military, and he was there and uh, and with a bunch of his friends, and, and there was me uh, with a machine gun in my hand. I believe it was an <laughs> M14. <laughs> so, I mean, clear, clear, yeah, right. Clearly the 70s were a little bit looser with the rules because that would obviously not happen in this day and age. But back then, you know, there's the guy going, hey, you want to check out the machine gun, kid? I'm like, yeah, sure. And I think shortly after that, my dad went, wow, you know, this is nuts. We, I think we should get out of here. <laughs> and at that time, they were offering immigration to South Africa, Australia, or Canada. Now, I me, mean, I would have been happy with any of those places. You know, Australia and South Africa, probably a lot warmer than Canada in the winter. <laughs> let's but, let's uh, choose the coldest Canada. place possible, right? <laughs> well, it, well, listen, I've been to Winnipeg, and I've been to the North Pole, and Winnipeg is colder than the North Pole. So <laughs> <laughs> apologies to all my friends in Winnipeg, but that was the truth. So anyway, yeah, we, we, we came over here, and the only reason they picked Canada was because it was the least distance to go in case they didn't like it. It was a shorter trip home. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, so it's like it's, it's kind of like just a, one of those kind of fluky stories. Uh, you know, I ended up here. I mean, I often wonder what my life would have been like had I stayed in Belfast. You know, I mean, maybe I would have moved to England. You know, would I even have played drums? I mean, I think I always would have played drums, but... You know, you often wonder because your, your life takes on a path and you go certain directions and then you meet certain people and, and things happen and that changes the trajectory of your whole life. So for me, coming to Canada was awesome because, A, it was such a multicultural city that I got kind of swept up into all these different uh, musical genres uh, and all these kind of pockets of, of different uh, ethnicities here and started hanging with everybody and playing with the Cuban community and the Brazilian community and the West African community got into a whole bunch of things because of music and drums, you know, and, uh, and I definitely don't regret any of it. So I'm pretty happy. My, my parents moved here, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. Well, so it, it, you've been in Canada since you were, you know, nine, 10 years old. Um, mm -hmm. You know, did you, I, I guess with your dad being a drummer, did he encourage it? Did you, you know, did he send oh. you off to lessons or did you learn from him? You know, what was your, your formal, uh, I guess, training? Well, when I was, uh, I don't know, um, I guess when I was about 11 or 12, uh, I think around 12, I was in grade six and my dad with his band had to go on a, a, a tour of the States for six months. So he took the whole family with him rather than go on his own. So I traveled around the United States for six months and going to schools in different cities. I may have even stopped in Kentucky. Kentucky, I'd have to ask him as he remembers. But uh, so during that time, I, you know, during the day, we had lots of free time. I said, hey, Dad, can you teach me drums? 
And he said, sure, I'd love to. So he would take me down in the afternoons and sit me on his kit. And now he was a left-handed player. So I learned probably those six months I played all left-handed until, uh, until he sort of changed me around to, to be right handly But I think that was kind of a, a clever way to get me to get my left hand a bit stronger because I led with the left hand on everything. Yeah. Um, just playing on the left-handed kit. And again, another happy accident. So he taught me and he taught me, and it's, it's a hazy memory for me, but he says I was progressing quite quickly, and then he gave me something that was just above my ability, and I hit a wall, and I couldn't handle it, and I threw the sticks down in a, stem, in a temper and said, that's it, I'm done. And my dad was like, oh, no, I pushed him too fast, too hard, that's it, it's over, it's finished. You know, because, you know, what parent doesn't want their, their kid to follow in their footsteps? So he, he did that, and then we came back to Canada. And then when I got to grade seven in my school year in a, in a middle school, or junior high school, as we call it, we, uh, I got into the stage band I was, and, and the concert band. In the concert band, I played saxophone, but in the stage band, I auditioned for the drums, and I got that. And then that was kind of it. Uh, pretty much there and then, I was like, I'm going to do this. I love this. I'm not stopping. stopping. This is going to be my future. And I kind of just started practicing like a, you know, like a, a crazed youngster uh, in love with the drums and, and put everything I could do to do that. My dad always would joke about my mom sending him to get me for dinner. And then my mom would come back 20 minutes later furious because my dad hadn't come back either because he was <laughs> outside my bedroom listening. And my, my mom would be like, Okay, dinner has been ready. It's on the table. It's getting cold. He said, "Oh no, no, listen, listen, no, no. He's almost got oh this. Oh, oh, he's almost got it." Kind of thing, right? <laughs> so I don't remember a lot of this, but these are the stories that he tells me. So it's, it's always kind of funny when he when he when he reminds me of these stories. I'm like, man, it's so long ago. I, I just remember always coming home and jumping on the kit. You know, that was kind of my daily routine every single day. I was always at the drums, on the drums, in school or out of school. It was just kind of. Uh, that, that love affair, you know, that, uh, that, that we have with this instrument. And that, that kind of set me on my path. You know, my dad, he taught me, you know, and continued to teach me. And then I think when I started getting older, um, I probably started teaching myself. And then I didn't take lessons until I hit college. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, I, there are so many similarities, you know, I, I was the kid that, you know, n- never really did formal lessons and, you know, uh, down here, you know, in the States, of course, it's marching band, right? It's not, yes, it, yes, it, it's not the, yes. the pep band or the show band or the stage band. It's, it's marching band. Right. And, you know, the thoughts of lugging around a 40 pound bass drum in August, you know, <laughs> I just had no interest <laughs> So it was, I bet. yeah, I mean, that just sounds like hell to me. So, um, you know, for me, it was buy a kit, learn playing along to my favorite records. Right. I mean, that was kind of my upbringing. So the fact right. that, but did anybody in the family play, play the drums or like, was there an influence from somewhere or no, it was all MTV for me. I mean, it was just, Oh wow. Okay. I, I want to be a, so you're a little bit younger than me. Cause that's the eighties. Right? Yeah, you're right. younger, So that's the eighties. Yeah. yeah. For so, me, it was records, right? My dad had this record collection, you know, and I still remember the main things I listened to was like buddy rich records, uh, tower of power with, with the awesome David Garibaldi and then Canadian artist called Gino Vanelli with this great Canadian German named Graham Lear who went yeah. on to play many years with Santana, you know, and, and it's funny because I'm, I'm happy and thrilled to say that I'm really good friends with Garibaldi and Graham now, That's you know, awesome. years later. So, so it was like, you know, when you meet your idols and they become your buddies, it's pretty cool. And you find out they're just awesomely great people. So those, those, uh, I mean, I think most everyone else I knew at that time, if they were playing music, were listening to just top 40 or rock stuff, you know, yeah. Pink Floyd, you know, B- Bowie, that kind of stuff. But I was listening to this kind of like really heavily syncopated stuff. Oh, and Earth, Wind and Fire as well. You know, so I was listening to, uh, you know, rhythmically some quite complex stuff that, you know, I didn't realize was rhythmically complex. It was just like, oh, I'm listening to this. Let me try and figure this out by just playing along with it type thing, you know? Yeah, and, you know, something that I've found, you know, I think a, a lot of people, you know, the, the relationship to jazz is either, you know, you had somebody that brought you to jazz early on. Right. And in your case, it's your dad. Right. He's, he's got Buddy yeah, Rich yeah. records 
or you discover jazz later on as a drummer. Right. And, and I fall into yeah. that latter camp. I, I, man, I can't swing at all unless it's like a Texas shuffle. Right. I, I just, <laughs> I don't have the ability to comp with my left hand. If the snare isn't uh, falling on two and four, I'm lost, you know, but I love jazz. I just can't play it for anything, you know, with, with a gun to my head, I couldn't do it. Um, and that's, <laughs> And that's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a developed listening skill. And, you know, I think, you know, the people who play it must listen to it a lot more than the people who don't, right? Because they're picking up the subtleties and the technique uh, just because they're absorbing more of the information. You know, my dad, he also had some Art Blakey things and some Max Roach things. So I was checking that stuff out as well. But, I mean, I would think back to my grade 11 music teacher in high school, in stage band, a guy named Lou Bartolomucci, who was only about 10 years older than me. He was like, you know, Mark, okay, the Buddy Rich thing is cool, but I think you need to check out, here, check out this record. It's called Friends by uh, Chick Corea. This guy, <laughs> Steve Gadd, you, you might dig this. I'm like, okay, sure. All right, I never heard of this guy, Steve, who's Steve Gadd? You know, and I was like, uh, like two, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was like, I must learn every note on this record. <laughs> right. You know, it's like one of those things that just changes your life. Yeah. You just go, what is this? You know, and then he was always, you know, he was, you know, going here, check out the Bracket Brothers, check out the Crusaders, you know, check out George Duke, check out this, you know, and, and here, here's Weather Report. Have you learned, listened to this? It was just kept kind of feeding me all this great, you know, this great music. And, you know, and even, even then, I mean, it's a funny story. Me and my buddy Colin, bass player, uh, in the, in the, in the school combo, we used to travel on the bus to our teacher's house on the weekends to jam because he played guitar and he played keyboards. So we'd go there and he'd be giving these, these ridiculously hard charts and going, play this. Can you say read this? And we're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think about that now. I'm going, would I let my kid go to the students, the teacher's house on the weekend? Probably not. No, Back I mean, then, that's to- again, yeah. again, totally normal. You yeah. know, my dad was like, yeah, okay, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. And you know, I mean, I say all the time that some of the most important lessons <laughs> Are somebody that's willing to hand you a, a CD, a record, a cassette, and say, you really ought to check this cat out because you're going to learn a lot just listening to this. Those oh, are- yeah. I, I, always, I always looked up to the older people if they told me something positive and or negative. Like, okay, why are they saying this? This, this must be important. And they're saying, I need to check this out, you know, um, so I better pay attention to what they're saying. Sometimes I didn't listen as well as I probably should have, <laughs> you know, that, that's being young and yeah. cocksure of myself. But, uh, you know, uh, definitely I was very interested in becoming as good as I could be, you know, to, to, to get things happening, you know. So yeah, for sure, man. Long, long journey, I guess. You know. Yeah. So I mean, I I'm just kind of curious. You know, you you had all this great musical education. You know, as a youngster, did you always know that you wanted to be a musician? You know, a, as a vocation, or did you try other things as a young adult? No, I uh, I knew I, I can I can literally remember being in my high school or junior high school cafeteria talking to my friends and one of the teachers and they're saying, what do you want to do with yourself when you're older boys? You know, that type of thing. And it's like, I'm going to be a drummer. I remember like consciously making that decision and I kind of did everything. I went out of my way to try and be as the best that I possibly could, you know, um, all through my life, I've tried to constantly improve myself. I was just practicing before the phone rang here, actually. <laughs> Excellent. But, uh, you know, um, I did I did that because that's I, was something I really wanted. And and my dad, having been in the, being in the, in the music industry, he was very clear about it. He said, Mark, you know, he said, he said it simply. He said, if you like music, don't go into the business. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, the more fun, the, yeah, right? The more fun the music you're going to play, the less money you're going to make and the, the harder it's going to be. You know, that's you know great advice. he said it was like the same thing in, in Ireland. He said, I could have played country music or, you know, but I wanted to play jazz and there was no money in that. And the guys were walking by me, getting their paycheck and just waving the cash in front of my face. See, that stuff you're playing, Sam, doesn't, doesn't pay, you know, come and, come and play this. My dad was like, no, I want to play, you know, this art music. And, and so, 
you know, I kind of continued on that. I mean, obviously I've done, you know, I've done a million, uh, like Jewish weddings, Italian weddings, Greek weddings, you know, <laughs> theater shows. I would take every gig because I would figure it's better to be on the drums playing no matter what the music was than not being on the drums and doing something that I yeah. really didn't want to do. So it was always worth it to be on the drums. So I took every gig and, and played every style of music that I could get my hands on and just branched out and met more people who were willing to take the chance on and hire me as a young, young player, you know? Well, and, and that's where the real education takes place. You know, I mean, I've, I, I, <laughs> I thought you know it, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, hard knock. yeah. And I've said, I don't know how many times if I never play brick house or brown eyed girl again, <laughs> that's great. You know, but I will, I know I will, you know, because yeah. I don't have that, that gene to say, yeah, I'm going to pass on that because you, you do, you take every gig. And even now as you know, in my mid forties, like if it sounds like it's pretty fun, I'll go do it because you never know who you're going to meet on that gig. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. The hang was a crucial part of networking and just, you know, and it was always fun, right? You know, just, you know, if the music was not something you enjoyed, at least if uh, the pay was good and the people were good, then it was worth it to me to go out and do the job. You know, it, it, it always had to have two out of those three categories, right? That's what they say. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's got to pay good. It's got, it's got to be, you know, good music. And the people got to be good. Now pick any two, because it's rare that you get all three. I've been lucky to get all three in certain environments, but uh, you know, there's definitely been some rough ones along the way. We just go, "Whoa, this is a brutal gig." Yeah. But even then, you know, even then, uh, that was a, the challenge. In that was to overcome that, to overcome that, and be a professional. You know, because again, with Steve Gadd, I would I would hear him on you know Chick Corea and Al Jarreau and all these really fun records and going, this is great. Then I'd hear him on something simple, like maybe a Barbra Streisand ballad going, why is he doing that? That's really boring. You know, and it took me maybe some time before I recognized, Oh wait, he's working 10 times more than anybody else. And the thing is, even though he's playing something really simple, it still sounds really good. Yeah. And if I played that simple thing, it does not sound that good. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. so there was this education about, okay, Steve seems to always respect the music and, and the job that he's doing and plays what's right for the gig. And that obviously was a huge lesson for me when I eventually figured it out. <laughs> it probably took me a few years to really understand that because, you know, especially when you're younger, you just want to do what you want to do and what you like. And then you're doing things that maybe you don't like and you go, ah, Oh, I don't really care about this. This is easy. And then you realize you're not doing a good job and it doesn't sound good because you're not respecting the music. You know, now I can play a lot of those things that I played younger, but I play them way better. Like, for instance, I didn't like Irish music when I was younger. And yet now I play with uh, two of Canada's premier fiddle players in the Celtic uh, genre, Natalie McMaster from Cape Breton and Danelle Leahy from the uh, Peterborough area area, you know, they, they are brilliant at what they do, but I'm playing like just kick, fall on the floor and, and um, te, um, te, um, te, um, te, um, te. but I play that really well now. Whereas when I was younger, I wouldn't have played it well because I would have thought, no, this is jive. This is like, this is not hip. Yeah. But now I realize the hipness is the fact that when you're playing a music, a style of music with someone who plays it really well, that's the hip factor right there. They play it fantastically. So I need to up myself to come up to their level. Even though it might be a very simple drum groove, I want to dig deep and make this and play this as well as I can. Now I have so much fun, you know, and the, the guitar player in the band also plays the Jazz Exiles, Elmer Ferrer. He's from Cuba. And there we are <laughs> playing Irish music. Yeah, you know, right. I'm looking at him going, "This is this is even I'm I, I am Irish, so for me this is kind of normal." But if you're Cuban, this is really weird for you. <laughs> and yet he plays it beautifully, right? Yeah, it's that kind of concept. Respect the music, and I think that, especially at this late stage of the game, for me, that is one of the most important things I try to impart on younger students because that's a really hard and difficult lesson to learn. 
Yeah. Well, and, you know, speaking of lessons and imparting on students, you know, um, it, it, part of my prep, you know, I, I research all of my guests, especially if if I haven't met them or, or don't know a yeah. lot. Um, you know, I saw some of the great content that you did for Drumeo up there in Canada. Oh, right on. You know, Jared and, and, and his <laughs> crew. Um, I, I guess they're over on the west coast of Canada, um, you know, yeah, the Vancouver yeah, area. They're a, yeah, uh, they're, about a, they're in Abbots, Abbotsford, uh, British Columbia. So they're about a five-hour plane flight for me. So it's gotcha. pretty far. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, you know. But, you know, one of the things that I saw is you talked about, you know, I, I, I didn't understand as I, when you were younger why, you know, I could play everything in perfect time but I didn't understand why it didn't feel real good or why people said, you know, yeah, your, your timing is great, but it doesn't feel right. You know, you got to work on the feel yeah. and you know, that's a real hard concept for younger players, especially, you know, they practice with the metronome and they're playing it in perfect time, but it doesn't yeah. feel right. You know, and that's one of the the great lessons that I would encourage our listeners to to go check out. It's not hard to find, um, right? That that you did on Drumeo, and it's it's brilliant how you talk through that. Oh well, thank you, thank you. It, it's it was one of my sort of challenges when I I, uh, I taught at a school called Humber College. I just retired there in December after eighteen years of teaching, and uh, I uh, I um. I wanted the students to really kind of benefit from mistakes that I made so that they wouldn't make the same ones. I tried to sort of get them guys, okay, let's, you know, I'd play in perfect time, but it just would sound really stiff. I said, that's perfect time. It does not automatically equate to a good groove. Let's talk about time feel now and placement of where you sit in relationship to the tempo. And I had to kind of, you know, dig into it and try and understand it and then try and figure out a way to explain it. And, and sort of that was like one of my primary goals. And of, of one of the funniest places where I picked up on the concept was the late, great martial artist, Bruce Lee. Oh, wow. And you're going to go, okay, what? <laughs> no, no, I get it. I, I totally get it. Bruce, in Enter the Dragon, there's a, t there's a scene that Bruce actually wrote into the script and said, you got to put this in. It's where he teaches a student. And he talks about the student trying to do a technical thing and the kid's not getting it. And at one point he just goes to the kid, you know, cause he asked him a question. He goes, kid goes, well, let me think. He says, taps him on the head and goes, don't think, feel. And I remember that resonating with me almost like in a, in a way that it made my body shake. Don't think, feel, you know, obviously we've got to think about what we're doing, but maybe sometimes we over uh, complicate things by focusing on and thinking about it too much and let, instead of letting it happen naturally. And so I started trying to understand, okay, what does it mean to feel music as opposed to think my way through beats and rhythmic and ideas and, and technique. What does it mean to feel music? And, you know, and I remember, you know, also when I was a student at Humber and I played with this, uh, a guest artist, a bass player from Montreal named uh, Ra Randy Coven. And he said, okay, that's great. After we play, he said, that's great. Now, Mark, I want you to just lay back on this. On, let's do it again, but just lay back a little bit on the time. And I thought he meant to lean back. You know, I, I was so, 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 you know, I just didn't understand what he meant. Lay back. What is, he wants me to lean back? What is that? You know, <laughs> and I went and I asked someone afterwards, what are you talking about? Well, lay back. Like, I'm not really sure what he meant. And, and here's what I got as a response. Jeez, man, if you have to ask. And then the guy walked away. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that old jazz world thing. The, like, yeah, you're asking the, the wrong the question. Yeah. That, imagine the terror of me going, oh, man, I'm supposed to know what this means. And <laughs> I don't. And he's not giving it to me. No, yeah. no, I think about it now. It's like maybe he just couldn't under, couldn't explain it because it's so esoteric. And that's, you know, part of the reason I had this kind of lifelong sort of uh, search to try and figure out a way to, to make this make sense, you know, and a big part of it, I came back to Steve Gadd again, you know, listening to him, I was picking up a lot of his, his ideas, but I was totally, oh, totally overlooking the fact that his groove and time feel was unbelievably fantastic. And then once I started, you know, hearing that, you know, again, going back to the listening skill, once I became aware of that, 
I couldn't not hear it. Then I started hearing it everywhere. Like, you know, I saw Bernard Purdy do a clinic and it was terrifyingly good. And I couldn't really figure out why I was liking it so much, you know, but when I look back, I just know that the groove was so vicious that it knocked me out, but I didn't know how to make myself sound like that. And then I saw Earth, Wind and Fire in 1980 in Toronto and that was just like a groove lesson, you know, <laughs> kicking in the butt. <laughs> yeah. It was unbelievable, right? So, so you get these experiences that stay with you, which I just call, you know, defining moments in, in my life. I can, I can think back to a specific ones, Gad being one, Bernard being one, you know, and, and, and Earth, Wind & Fire being another. You know, my first trip to Cuba, seeing my first Roomba. These were like, you know, almost, almost spiritual experiences for me, just kind of digging that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, man. Well, I, I just think it's, it's, um, you know, it's something that's so hard to learn how to do well. Um, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. it's something for every drummer to aspire to. And, and, you know, I played in a band in the, you know, early 2000s where everything was so far behind the beat you know it was kind of a, an americana blues oh yeah you awesome. know and i did that gig for a couple of years and the first time i i played w with a different group you know it was like hey hey man you're really far behind the beat and that's not what we're going for here it almost ruined <laughs> yeah. me right you know yeah, it, it's, it's 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 not to everybody's taste, right? Which is right. funny because I love it. You know, you, you listen to guys like Jim Keltner, Lee Von Helm, John Bonham, uh, Ricky Fatar with uh, with Bonnie Raitt. You know, uh, you, you listen to these guys. Their time feel is behind the beat. They sit on the backside and just go, "Oh man, Gad!" Of course, you just go, "Oh." It's so awesome. Yeah. You know, I would play my students "Chucky's in Love" by Ricky Lee Jones. If you're familiar with that track with Gad and they would all just kind of go, you know, you could see them physically shift in their chair when Gad <laughs> came in on the drum, just go, Oh, oh, oh man, that's almost painful. Yeah. It's so heavy. You know, and I say, are you digging this? Check this out. And I would have a whole class just on time, feel and groove for the students say, okay, great. Let's listen to this. Okay. Let's listen to this. You know, I'd play Carlton Barrett with uh, Bob Marley and go check out this, you know, and, and, you know, Jim Keltner with Eric Clapton or something. I just had all these various different players with different time fields. And I, and, and, and I really just kind of wanted to introduce the concept to them because, you know, that was not, I had to kind of fall and trip over it myself when I was younger because, uh, well, just the education system was, was slightly different, you know, yeah. a different way of, of teaching. It's like play with a metronome. Okay. Have a good time. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then not a lot of people were talking about, okay, you need to fix the groove and the feel, you know, uh, so it became like a life, almost a lifelong obsession for me to just try and make it feel good. You know, you know, one of the guys, I don't know, uh, you know, Carlos Vega for me was almost the most perfect, flawless drummer I've ever heard on recordings. Every note he played was like so perfectly placed that it was just like the most flawless time feel I've ever heard in my life, you know, and I know there's a bunch of guys up here and we just thrive on listening to Carlos. He doesn't do him with James Taylor, something you think would be really, you know, kind of simple pop folky stuff. And you go, no, no, it's so heavy. Yeah. This is as heavy as the Mahavishnu orchestra for me. It's so deep. Yeah. The pocket is so deep, you know, you know, I would tell my students a good, a good groove is timeless. We'll be studying Earth, Wind, and Fire 200 years from now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I come from the rock world, and I mean, there yeah. are guys that are still trying to dissect, you know, bar 32 of one of Bonham's songs, you know, it's like, <laughs> l listen to sure. this thing he does in the 32nd bar. It's mind blowing. And, you know, I mean, people are still trying to figure that stuff out, you know, 50 years on. And, yeah, you or know, Ringo. 60 years on. Yeah, you know? exactly. And I mean, there's, there are whole people that, that become, you know, just, you know, sycophants about that stuff. And, and it's great, you know, and I think if it moves the ball for you, then go for it for sure. And yeah, it, it, we'll call, we'll call those healthy obsessions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> healthy obsessions. That's, that's a good way to put it, Mark. I like that. Um, yeah. So, 
you know, I mean, your CV reads, you know, a who's who, and, and we can talk about any of that stuff that you want to, but suffice it to say somewhere along the way, you made the decision to, you know, and this goes right along with the whole theme of this whole podcast for five years almost mm-hmm. to take the reins. I don't want to be a side man. Um, I want to create something that's that's mine. I want to step out as a leader. And, and that is so commendable. Um, you know, so let's talk a little bit about the Jazz Exiles with you as a leader and a composer and writer. Um, I, I think it's pretty amazing, you know, and, and you guys have been doing this. This is your, what, your third record now? Third record, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so talk to me a little bit about the the what germinated inside your head to say, okay, I'm I'm ready to step out as a leader and and do my own thing. Well, I got to go back to around 1990. I was playing with a rock band here in Toronto, playing drums, and I was doing a lot of background. And then the manager noted of the band said, you know, Mark, you got a pretty good voice. You should come out front and sing. I was like, mm, no thanks. <laughs> and he kept, he kept pushing me and pushing me and talked me into it. And that, I actually got my first taste of leading a band, believe it or not, as a front man. I wrote, started, I wrote and, and you can go on iTunes and find a record called No More Heroes from 1994. Me trying to be like a sting pop kind of character, uh, heavily influenced by kind of that kind of genre. But it, it was my pop project. So I actually started as a leader as a singer before I even got into the band to sing with the drummers, the drums, you know? So I did that for a while and then just kind of dealing with record companies kind of burned me out and I just bailed and went back <laughs> to playing drums and I never did it again. And I think, yeah, um, probably, you know, I did my, uh, I did two pop records and then in 2004 I decided to do kind of, you know, when the digital recording thing started to hit at home and I was able to do stuff at home, I put out a record called Lost Kingdoms, which is kind of like a, you know, a global jazz kind of mixed bag of pop and fusion. And then, uh, but I, I, the music was so complex with so many overdubs, I couldn't do it live uh, because there was just, you know, I'd need 10 vocalists to do all the layering <laughs> right. and stuff that I did. So that never went any further. And then I think around... 2006 or, or something, I was about getting ready to uh, uh, start my own band. I had the name, the Jazz Exiles. I thought that's cool. Who do I want to have play in it? And I was thinking of players. And then my wife got pregnant, and we had my son, Connor. And then then I uh, I, I stopped touring because I was touring with Gino Vanelli at the time. And then I stopped touring, and then I picked up the teaching gig, and then lo and behold, like, Jeez, you know, like 10 years went by <laughs> Life. in a blink of an eye and the band was all just got thrown to the back until 2015. I thought, oh, I, I want to bring, I want to resurrect this band, you know, now because uh, I saw like friends of mine, there were a lot of drummers here in town, Larnell Lewis being one of them and Ernesto Savini, Barry Romberg, Daniel Barnes, a lot of drummers here leading their own groups and clubs. And I thought, you know what? I want to have a go at that now. I, I, let me get in on some of this. Picked some musicians, got guys who were interested, uh, booked a gig, and then write, wrote the tunes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's the way to started, do it. Started writing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, deadlines, right? I, yeah. I play a little bit of piano, just enough to kind of write, and I sing all the melodies, and I made demos of stuff, put the band together, and, and then went to the gig. You know, and I was terrified, thinking, man, my name is on this. <laughs> this is my original music. What are people going to think? And the funniest backhanded compliment I got was from a young bass player said, Mark, man, wow, this band sounds amazing. I mean, I knew I would with the players, but the tunes, the tunes, they're surprisingly good for a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, okay, thank you, I think. You know, it was kind of funny. Uh, and then it just, it just uh, steamrolled from then. I, I did the first record. And then we got nominated for a Juno, which is like a Canadian version of the Grammys. Yeah. We lost, but, uh, you know, it was still pretty interesting and cool. Like, wow, my first solo record of my original music, we got nominated. Might be something to this. Jumped into a second record right away with some extra leftover tunes. And then 
And then I kept you know, working with the band, and then I took a little break because I wanted to maybe do something a little bit more traditional, and I put out a record called The Chronicles of Fezziwig, uh, the character from Charles Dickens' uh, 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 Christmas Carol, uh, who was Ebenezer Scrooge's boss. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of an inside joke about uh, the older boss being replaced by the younger, you know, the younger worker. And I was thinking at that my age, in my 50s, this could easily be me and anyone of my generation being, you know, okay, you're done. You're an old horse. Out you go. It was me trying to kind of hang on and fight to, to, for validity in a music scene where I was now aging out of a little bit. So I started to, I, I put together this trad album and, and uh, had the great uh, Pat LaBarbera uh, play saxophone on it and a bunch of other local awesome musicians. But Pat, the funny thing was Pat was my first instructor when I was 18 at, at, uh, Humber as a student, you know, and here's me, I'm thinking I'm playing with this guy who played with Alvin and played with Buddy Rich. It's pretty awesome. So now I got him on my record. It was also pretty awesome. You know, it was just kind of a nice circle, you know, 40 years later, you know, to have him playing on my stuff. And then, then this year it was in COVID. I was like, you know, struggling through COVID like everybody else teaching, and I was thinking, man, I haven't written anything. And then last April, last year, I just sat down and boom, I knocked out like the, these 10 songs for the record. And then I was like, all right, guys, why don't we do a record? And then recorded it. And I was like, okay, great. And then just thought of what I wanted to, you know, how do I want this to go? And, you know, uh, I got it recorded and everything, got the title of Dragon's Tale, which is a reference to Bruce Lee again uh, from a movie of his called uh, The Way of the Dragon. Uh, where he was talking about a particular martial art move about the dragon spins its tail, you know, and I took that as a metaphor for the unseen, something you don't expect to, to rise up, you know, uh, always, yeah, be, yeah. always, always keep your eye open and, and, and be aware of things that you're not particularly focused on, you know, even musically or just environmentally or whatever. And I thought the dragon's tail, that's hip. And I always pass my names in the, the titles through my wife, Patricia, and said, what do you think of the dragon's tail? And she's like, oh, yeah, I like it. Said, okay, that's a pass. <laughs> you know, because if she says no, I, it's like, okay, that's out. She doesn't like it. She's usually right. So uh, well, the dragon's tail, and, and that, that got, led me to uh, hiring Chris, you know, to, uh, to, to do the promotion in the States, which led me here to you. So it's, it's a big, long, you know, uh, trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, look, man, when Chris comes to me and, and, you know, Chris has actually been a guest on the show and, and, you know, right. it, so, um, it, 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 Chris and I happened on each other by sheer accident. I had, uh, Aaron Comes from the spin doctors and, you know, great, yes. great jazzer in New York. Um, you yeah. know, I, I reached and Eric, Schenk, Eric Schenkman, the guitar player in yeah. that band from Toronto. Yeah, man. So I had Aaron on the show very early on. I think he was like guest, you know, number eight or something. I mean, he was very early on and I did it all on my own. I just reached out to him. I was like, hey, you know, I'd love to have you on the show. And he was like, yeah, sure, man. Um, and Chris reached out and he was like, hey, you just had a guy that I work with on your show. Would you like me to to send you some folks. I mean, is that something you would be receptive to? <laughs> uh, yes, of course, <laughs> y you know, and um, so it, it started kind of, you know, this, this great friendship, but when Chris comes to me and says, Hey, here's something I think you should check out. I think it's right up your alley. He has yet nice. to be wrong. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he has yet to send anybody my way where I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a good fit. And, you know, down, yeah. the, down the rabbit hole I go. Right. So. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I've been listening to the record for, you know, a couple of weeks, um, you know, and one of the things that I notice, the Jazz Exiles is the perfect name because, yes, this is jazz, but I can immediately pick up on the funk, the Tower of Power stuff coming through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I can hear all of that. And you definitely don't tune your drums like a traditional jazz drummer. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I hear that 
Chick Corea, you know, the Steve Gadd, yeah. the Dave Weckl. I hear those things when I listen to the record. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, all yeah. of it's, that it's comes a, through. Yeah, it's a jazz fusion for sure. And the name is kind of was a kind of a funny play on words because, um, okay, this not to, I don't want to be going too long on this story, but there, you know, there's a certain faction of the, the jazz community that are uh, nicknamed the jazz police because it's like they're into traditional jazz and they only want to kind of do that one thing. I've been arrested you know, by the totally, jazz police is, many, many times in my <laughs> life. Let me yeah, tell a, you. A few, so. cit- a few citations. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, and, and they, you know, to be honest, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just kind of a, a funny term. You know, so I played with a band, and we we called ourselves. Someone came up, uh, Roberto Acapenti, a good friend of mine, a bass player, a jazz bass player. He he said, "You guys should call yourself the Montuno Police." Now, the Montuno is a repetitive uh, phrase played by pianos, by the piano players in in uh, Afro-Cuban music. Right, they would go to a Montuno section, and then they would play this piano part, and a lot of piano players would pick up on it, and they so it was kind of a joke, the Montuno Police. And I thought, okay, why don't I take it one step further? and call ourselves the jazz exiles because not only does everybody in the band like a, a legit bona fide jazz player, but we also play pop music. We also play South American music. Yeah. You know, we play, you know, rock, you know, to me, you know, it's, it's music. I like music. I don't like, there's a lot of things out there that I'm into and, and it's very difficult to, to just kind of want to play one thing. I, I can't, you know, if I played one thing for too long, I would start missing the other music. You know, it would be like, oh, but I love this too. Yeah. You know, because to me, it's all about the rhythmic structure, right? And the rhythmic structure in so many different styles is so heavy and so deep. Why would I want to cut myself off from that as a drummer and say, I just want to do this one thing and this this thing, you know? So, you know, and I, and I look at jazz, you know, it's like we say many roots, many branches. It's a big umbrella. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, there's yeah, and I talk about this all the time. Like there's so many guys that move to New York because that's kind of the the jazz mecca in the states. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And you know, if you go to a jazz club and you're not part of that world, like you're you're an interloper walking in, if you ask the wrong question, you may never get a gig in your life in New York City. Yeah, yeah, you could get vibes. Yeah, I know, right? Like, yeah. like, oh, this guy is such a hillbilly hick. You know, he 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 doesn't <laughs> oh, know no. what's oh, going oh, oh. on. You know, I, but I mean, there is that in the world of jazz, and and as you said, it's a big umbrella, man. Like, you don't, yeah. Like, if everybody just does it the same way, it never evolves. And maybe some people want it that way. But I, I mean, yeah. I, I remember when Dave Weckl first hit the scene, and people were like, "Oh, but he's not a traditionalist," you know. And, you know, people talked about the great Bill Stewart. They were like, oh, but he doesn't play traditional grip. He can't fit in, you know, <laughs> like, like well, what are I we know. doing it's, as it's, musicians if that's what I our know. bar is, right? Yeah, uh, maybe that comes from insecurity. I'm not even sure. You know, it's, it's a thing, it's a form of elitism that exists out there, which is kind of a drag. You know, I first heard Bill Stewart with Maceo Parker on Maceo Parker's first solo record. Yeah, which is you know pretty, uh, pretty darn good. <laughs> which is right. So I'm going, oh, this Bill Stewart guy's like got a nice pocket. He's good, funky. Mm, who's this jazz guy? Huh, he's got the same. Well, is that the same guy? <laughs> yes, it is. It's like, what? Yeah. Wait, what? And then you look at and you look at Brian Blade. You know, people go, a legit jazz player. You know, from down in Louisiana. It's like, okay, great. And then he goes on tour with Seal. Are you going to knock him for that? Why? Right. It's music. It's music. And, and Brian, you know, I've met Brian a couple of times, and that guy is all about love, man. He's like, I love everything. I love music. I love people. I said, yeah, that's the vibe. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a drag. You know, I, I do think that we're, we're getting away from it in certain areas, thankfully, because you see a lot of people doing a lot of different things. You know, and, and even if, if you know, look at guys like, you know, the, you know, you're talking about Dave Wecko with Chick Corea. Are you, are you going to say Chick Corea was not a bona fide jazz guy? <laughs> right. And he, he's, he's making bad choices. What, what do you, what do you, what are you actually saying? You know, it's kind of a weird thing. Chick knows exactly what he's doing. He found <laughs> right. this young, young group of people who were 
really awesome at what they did. And he, he recorded with them, and, and it's like still under the, it's the jazz fusion thing. Yeah. You know, so maybe you don't like, maybe you don't like that or whatever. You know, I, 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 I get it. I get both sides. I think I can see both sides of the equation. It's just a drag when it causes it causes a negative vibe towards the other side, you know. Yeah, because and it's not like, it's you, not exclusive, you know, right? Yeah, it's not exclusive to jazz. Yeah. I mean, we've got it in all genres, right? But yes, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. But I, yeah. But in the drumming community, which I feel there's an inherent closeness amongst all drummers, that we are all part of a global drumming community. Yeah. There's like a thing that's like we are all we are all part of this and we all play the same instrument and we all love rhythm. And that's really in its simplest, purest form. We love rhythm. That's yeah. why we're here. So yeah. what if this guy plays this rhythm or this guy plays this rhythm? Big deal. It's all that is the biggest umbrella of all. The rhythmic umbrella is the largest sweeping umbrella that goes the farthest and the deepest. And, and quite frankly, the oldest, thing that <laughs> right. we have existed co coexisted with since mankind has been on the earth even before mankind in the animal community yes. they would have had discovered rhythm of their own prior to us even existing it's yes. so deep you know so it's a drag when we when we kind of get a throw a negative slant on it you know it, it's uh you know we just try and 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 be a part of the community and be you know and and do our thing you know because now, I know you now, and now me and you, we, if we, when we meet at some point in the future, it'll be like, hey, man, we're buddies. Exactly. <laughs> well, and I say, you know what I, mean? I, I say it all the time, you know, and that's what this podcast is all about is just like bringing everybody under the same roof kind of thing, right? And, and shedding yeah. light. And I joke all the time. I was like, you know, if you, you know, if you need to dig a ditch in your backyard for whatever reason, call a drummer because they're always like, Oh yeah, sure, man. I'm in. <laughs> right. <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if you need to move, yeah. call a drummer, don't, don't call a guitarist, <laughs> call a drummer because drummers are always like, yeah, man, I'm down to help out. Yeah. You know, so it, it's yeah, just, I know that again, a communal vibe. We like, we like to hang. Yes. Like to hang. Yes, for sure. And, <laughs> and you know, I think that's one of the cool things about, the name you chose, I get it completely. But, you know, as I listen through the record, you know, the compositions are great, you know, and, and one of oh, the thanks. questions, you. oh, you're welcome. But one of the questions that I always ask all of these great drummer guests that I have on the show that have composed a bunch of songs, I, I'm always curious. And the answer is almost always the same, but I'll ask you, do you start from a rhythmic perspective when you're composing or do you start with a melody or does it depend? It's, you know what? It's different. I've sat at the drums and come up with a groove and went, Ooh, I want to write something like that. I've sat at the keyboards and like, I, I'm a hacker piano player. Um, and I've come up with something and gone, Oh, let me hit record. Let me record that. And then come back to that. Sometimes I'll get an idea just, by singing it and I've on uh, my phone's got like it's layered with like I, rhythmic ideas or melodic ideas or groove ideas and I just sing them into my phone and then I run home because inevitably I forget what it was you know if I'm walking my dog or something and I get home to, let me put that thing on oh yeah that's oh yeah there's the idea <laughs> yeah and it works like that but I mean I can barely play piano you know but the, the thing for me is I, I have to reverse engineer my songs harmonically because I play almost you know, the rhythmic thing. No problem. I understand that the melodic thing. I can sing that that's easy, but the harmonic thing is the most challenging part, finding the chord changes that go with things. Yeah. And so I actually just sit down and I look, I move my hands around until I find sounds or progressions that sound nice. So my, my whole concept is based on sound less than theory. And, you know, some of my other musician friends go, keep doing what you're doing because <laughs> it's working. It's like, oh, man, I wish I knew what I was doing. He's like, no, no. Okay, well, if you're doing this to this. But your ears are so well attuned that you understand it. You just don't know what it's called. Right. So I would do that and come up with ideas based on sound. And then I would sing the melodies so that I could make sure that my saxophone player had places to breathe. 
you know, that if I can sing it and breathe, he can play it and breathe. And I know my musician's uh, abilities are so high that I can play things that normal, like maybe regular musicians might not be able to play. They can go, and because they love the challenge, they go, I said, is this hard? They go, oh, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> then they go, but I can do it. Well, you know, that little, yeah. like, like throw, a little throw down. Oh, you guys think you can play this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really hard, but we're going to get it, you know. So they kind of dig that that challenge that I keep it for them. But uh, I'm writing for specific people, so I know their abilities, and that helps me uh, when I get into some of the complex rhythmic things that, yeah, these guys can handle this. They'll understand this stuff, even if it's, you know, kind of uh, off the beaten path rhythmically. But, yeah, so it comes from various places, singing a melody, playing a groove, uh, 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 sitting down at the piano and just noodling around and, and finding uh, a, a nice chord change and then moving my hands to another chord change and go, oh, that's a nice, oh, I like that. And then that, I just need a, I just need a starting point. And once I've got a starting point, inevitably the, the, the ideas come out and start flowing and I can, you know, finish a song uh, in a couple of hours. So I, it, I'm, I, kind of, I feel like I'm kind of lucky that way, you know, but uh, that's, that's been my progression. Like I write in, in stints, like I haven't written anything in ages since I wrote this record. I probably haven't written anything. So, but I just kind of, the ideas come to me at a particular time and it's like a big, big idea fest and then nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, so man, I'm, it's I'm working, the, I'm right? The, yeah, I'm opening the portal and then the portal closes. Yeah. Well, the way I, I look at it. Hey man, you know, if, you know, I heard Keith Richards say once that like he had a tape recorder going and passed out in the middle of the night, you know, with this tape recorder going, he was like, I woke up the next day and there's the riff for satisfaction. And satisfaction. I don't, yeah, I don't, I read that in his book. Don't remember anything about it. So <laughs> do what you right. know. Do what you do, and sometimes it just works out, right? So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a whole concept of that we as human beings are vessels. The people who go into music, we're vessels for music to come out through us from some great space somewhere. You know, yeah, man. Yeah. Call it whatever you want, but it's kind of a just like we're vessels for ideas and you create something that's really beneficial to humanity i think you know because uh, i often say imagine the world without humor and music you know would that be brutal or what yeah, yeah man it, it, it's not a world that i want to live in i'll say that no no kidding <laughs> you know i love to laugh and i love music yeah. i love so much about it you know and and i've been doing it a long time and, and that's the beautiful thing is i still am as eager as i was at 13 when it comes to the instrument and music and playing music, you know, uh, maybe I even appreciate it even more, you know, at, you know, having done it for 47 odd years, you know, so it's kind of, it's kind of a funny thing. Yeah, man. But it, you know, if it works, it works. Right. I mean, I just, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just think that most um, of us as musicians and, and a lot of people will, will make the joke here and go, well, drummers, they're not really musicians. Right. You know, I, I hear oh, that. Yes. I hear that shit all the time and it drives me bananas, but I, I just yeah. think when most, someone, when someone throws, if someone throws a joke at me like that, I go, Hey man, that was really funny. In 1974. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and that's, Times have changed. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and great musicians will tell you, you know, I've heard Pat Metheny and Bob Mincer, a lot of guys talking, going, oh, man, sometimes the drummer is the most musical person in the group. Yes. You know, and, and I never forgot when they said that, and I'm happy that they said that because, yeah, they, you still hear those kind of, uh, I'll call them ignorant jokes, They're, you know, because drummers – can be not all, and not not all, not all, of course. But in many cases, drummers can be a very, very highly musical uh, people. Yes, and you know, but, and, you know in. In most of my musical situations, you know, I take on the role of of a ranger in chief, right? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like, yeah, maybe the bridge doesn't go after the second chorus before the solo, right? I mean, it's like maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe we do something different here. And 
But I just think all of us as musicians just want to get an idea out into the world and have it heard. And yeah, all records, I, I, albums, whatever you want to call them, even songs, they're a snapshot in time, right? That is absolutely, it absolutely. is the best I could do at that particular time. And that's what we committed to tape or hard drive. And now I just want people to hear it. And then it reflects back, right? Like I hear what people oh, yeah. say and, and it's kind of like you're, you're really holding up a mirror for the world, right? I oh, mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a very personal thing. I think that one of the best descriptions I ever heard came from uh, Joni Mitchell. And she said, you know, putting out, putting out a record is like sending your, your kid to school but you know they're going to get beat up. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. damn, yeah. that is a hard, cold truth right there. Because, yeah, it's, it's, your, it's, it's very personal. It's like, here's my music. I'm offering it to you to like, you know, and some people are going to go, oh, that's horrible. What is that? Yeah. You know, some people are going to go, oh, yeah, it's okay. And then other people are going to go, man, I love this. You, you can't please everybody, you know. So if some people like it, that's a good sign, you know. Well, you like it, you know, a couple of people I've sent it to are, are getting good feedback, and that's great. But, I mean, deep down, I know it's good. I know the quality's good, the playing's good, and I think the songs are strong, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's a snapshot of me at this moment in time, you know. Well, and it's, it's, a, good, it's a good Polaroid, Mark. Let me just say that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I think it's – for me anyway, when I hear other musicians creations and the, and, 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 you know, I, I don't know if I approach it from a different perspective than Joe Q public, who's not a musician, but I try to mm -hmm. understand what, what is the emotion they're getting across here? What, where was the head space? What are the sonic choices that were made in the studio, for example, and I, I just, I, I can find good in everything, right? That's a great way to think. That's awesome, man. That's great. You know, I can find good in everything. Like, I haven't had a lot of hip hop drummers on the show. That's not my world. I don't understand mm -hmm. it a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But there's mm -hmm. good and bad in every genre, right? And and oh, when, absolutely. When I listen to your creation here, I'm like, man, this is a really good record. It's you know, I I get it. And this oh, is thanks. one that I you appreciate could, that. Oh, you're welcome. But this is one you could put on at a party, and nobody's gonna go, man, turn that off. You know, I mean, I. <laughs> 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 ah, he's playing jazz fusion at this party. This is horrible. Let me get out of here. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite artists anywhere right now is a, a singer songwriter, kind of Americana artist named Jason Isbell. And, you know, he put out a record a few years ago called Southeastern. And one of my buddies was like, Hey, have you heard the new Jason Isbell? And I was like, yeah, he was like, boy, that's not a record you're going to put on at a party. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> but but it's true. And yet you never know. You but you never know. I mean, you could put it on and, and people could right. dig it. You never know. I mean, I've 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 made the mistake of underestimating audiences before. I've gone in and gone, ooh, look at an older <laughs> crowd. We're loud, man. They're not gonna dig this. And then at the end of it, you know, they're coming up going, This was awesome. And you're going, <laughs> Really? Yeah. Wow. I totally didn't expect this. Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny. Sometimes we just read the room wrong. You know, I'm guilty of that for sure. Yeah. You know, and you know, it's, it's hard to know. I even sometimes I remember teaching and thinking that's probably the worst class I've ever taught. And then later in the day, a student just by happenstance would come up and say, man, that class today was probably my favorite one of the whole semester. Yeah. I'm like, Really? I thought it was horrible. I couldn't, I felt like my ideas were all over the place and no one was digging it. And he's like, Oh no, it was fantastic. It's like, man, I don't know which way's up. Yeah. You just can't tell. That's why you just got to get it out there. Well, that, right. That, but that, I mean, that's why art is subjective. I mean, there have yeah. been, 
there have been sessions that I've been on where I'm like, I'll say to the producer or the engineer after like take three and, and go, man, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm not feeling it or, you know, I, I'm sorry that I'm not getting it. And they're like, what are you talking about, man? You were on fire right there. That was fantastic. Right. You know, I, right. Oh, I know. It is like, I know. That, you just kind of, it's, perfect for that song and it's like what is so i i get it i really do yeah we're our worst we're our worst enemies when we become overly analytical and lose uh, the big picture perspective you know yeah man. i think that just happens to everybody when you get too close to music it's sometimes like this oh, this record sucks i can't release it it's no good <laughs> you know I, I when i i did an instructional dvd you know and i thought when i was getting ready to release it i thought I can't, this is horrible. I can't, I can't release it. It's, it's terrible. This is a disaster. It's a mess. What have I done? You know? And then I, you know, uh, one of my friends was like, or actually one of my students said, I'm, I'm dying to see your DVD. Can you send it to me? And I sent it, I said, okay, but I, it, I don't think it's going to come out. I'm, I'll, I'll give you a bootleg copy here. You'd let me know. And he comes back and he sat and he watched my, probably the whole thing, like it was four hours. And he's like, Mark, this is brilliant. This needs to be heard by everybody. I'm like, are you sure? Because <laughs> I I don't think it's any good. And he's just looking at me like, what? You know. But but I'll tell you a funny story. You know, well, I was I had lunch with uh, with Steve Gadd. There's me name dropping. Uh, um, I had lunch with Steve Gadd when he was in town. Him and Luis Conte and my dad. We went out to a nice uh, restaurant for lunch. And we had a great talk, and, and I was trying not to bug him about music, and, but on the way home, I t- started asking him about where he got his, his, his shuffle from, because Steve Gadd's shuffle, to me, is like the ultimate shuffle, mm-hmm. so heavy. And he said, oh, you know, it, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, we play some shuffles in the show. And I said, yeah. And he said, did it sound okay? <laughs> and I, I looked at him like, <laughs> are you nuts? <laughs> Dude, you're, you're Steve Gadd. Like, what are you talking about? I said, okay, I said, you don't, okay, because you are Steve Gadd, you don't know what it's like to not be Steve Gadd and to listen to Steve Gadd. The shuffle was awesome. He's like, oh, okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, I was like, okay, I am not worthy to answer this question kind of vibe. I was like, what are you talking about? How can you, how can you ask me that? It's, it's like it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. You know, it's just, but I, it's like, again, it just showed me that Steve Gadd's a human being, you know, capable of thinking, oh, man, maybe I had an off night. And where we don't ever hear it because it's so fantastic. Well, you know, I mean. Human, I, human nature, right? It's a funny yeah. thing. Well, you know, I, I'll tell my Steve Gadd story, you know, when I started this awesome. podcast, you know, almost five years ago. Uh, yeah. You know, I knew that Chris had worked with him at one time. Right. And I know John DeChristopher, who kind of manages, right, yeah. you know, Steve's yeah. stuff. And I reached out to both of them and I was like, hey, man, I really want to have Steve on the podcast. And they both, and, and John DeChristopher especially, he was like, listen, man, he was like, I'll ask him, but Steve really hates talking about Steve. He, he doesn't, <laughs> you know, he doesn't have any interest, like he would come on and, and talk about somebody else's record before he would come on and talk about one that he's played on. And <laughs> I was like, really? He was like, yeah, man, it's just, I, I'll see, but probably not. And maybe that's the genius of it all, right? Is that yeah. you don't get so far down in the weeds on your own stuff. Maybe, maybe that's well, the brilliance of it. I, it must be because they, you know, they're, they're treated almost like a drum God, you know, in the community. So it must be, it must be kind of difficult. You know, I, I've heard stories about various people, you know, having great conversations with their favorite drummers. And then they ask a drummer question and the people just go, uh, ruined it. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, Oh, we were having a great conversation about fishing or some skiing or something. And now we're back to this, you know, and, 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 and Steve, like, Steve is one of the most humblest cats I've ever met. You know, for someone who's with his body of work, you just go, wow. It's so fantastic when you meet them and they are humble and kind and generous. 
you just you you can't even believe it. Garibaldi's the same way, you know. He I've talked to him about his drumming thing, and he's like, ah, oh, no, nah, come on, man, no, no, no. It's like the guy Clyde Stubblefield and, and Jabo, man, come on, those guys, you know, check out and these guys. And he's always talking about other drummers. I'm like, David, come on, man, the power of power. You created a vocab, you created a vocabulary, man. Like, come on, you have you have contributed immensely. To the, the the rhythmic and drumming world, he's like, oh man, you think so? I'm like, God, man, you guys are so humble, it's unbelievable, <laughs> right? It's it's just it's beautiful, you know. It, it's it's really great, you know, and it's inspiring, you know, because I've definitely met some people who are less than nice, you know. So sure. when you meet the nice people, you just go, I want to be like that guy because that's awesome. He made me feel great just hanging out with him. And he yeah. was very kind and very, very friendly. And it's like, yeah, that's what I aspire to be like, you know, and uh, I think it comes naturally to us Canadians anyway. But, uh, you know, it's always nice to meet people, you know, who you've revered their work, you know, even if it's not a drummer. I remember at NAM once meeting Abraham Laboreal Sr., the bass player. And I was just like, Abraham, listen, man. I'm not even a bass player, but I just wanted to say how much I've followed your playing and, and your music and your bass playing. I just love everything about it. I'm gushing to the guy. You know, he could have told me to get lost. He said, oh, man, thank you. We are all brothers. And he reached out and gave me a great big hug. Yeah, I was like, yeah, that's somebody that gets come it. Come on. Yeah. That, that's, that's what you do. That's, that's how you treat people who are nice to you. You know, it's. Yeah, it's an education. I'm constantly being schooled on just even how to be a human being by many of these great, great, great artists. You know. Well, I mean, I tell people all the time: all of the greatest people I've ever known are all Canadians. So <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. You know, it's, <laughs> I say that you know in jest, but it, there's some truth to that. You know, I mean, I, I have the great fortune of endorsing. Um, you know, a couple of Canadian companies, Dream Symbols and Lost Cabos Drumsticks. Oh, and oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know man. Andy from Dream Symbols. Yeah, and Andy's a good guy here. I love Andy. Yeah, man, and I, it's just like I don't know what it is, but you guys just get how to treat other people way better than us uh, Yankees do for whatever reason. Yeah, that's different. It's a different. But, you know, I'm sure there's people up here that are not friendly and not kind. And, you know, you've just been lucky not to have met any of them or ran into them, you know? Yeah, well, I'm yeah. Sure and, we have our... And I think they live like more than 50 miles within our border or something, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> the, gr <laughs> the great majority oh, of you guys just know how to treat people. So um, I want to be respectful of your time, Mark. Um, one thing that I've got to get to before we wrap up here. Tell everybody how on October 28th, when the Dragon's Tale drops, how are they best suited to pick up a copy? And I don't know if you follow the show, but I always say buy a physical copy if possible, because that puts the most money in our pocket, right? Yeah, well, I'm 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 actually avoiding going digital right now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to do a CD right now. I'm now, I'm toying with vinyl. I'm just looking at that because the cost has come down from what I thought it was last year. So I'm looking into that. But for now, it's going to be digitally uh, on all streaming services, you know, Spotify, iTunes. All It'll be all those places. I'll put it up on Bandcamp. Uh, but it'll also be on my website, um, which is the best way to get it. Go to my website and buy it directly from me and download the files. Yeah. Um, it, it, and, and that is www.groovydrums.com. And you'll go there and you'll see my face. And the other thing I should point out is that as with all my other records, um, I do remove my drum tracks and sell the band tracks as play alongs. Oh, wow. And, uh, so you can download the, the tracks. You can buy the tracks with me playing them, but you can also buy separate uh, tracks with uh, some drum charts if you're looking for play alongs of, of some tunes that are, you know, a little bit rhythmically challenging. So that that's a big option that uh, Chris and I were going to push for the drum community. Fantastic. Buy, the, buy the music with me on it and hear what I do. And then, uh, and then um, you can also have the music without me and play along to it and just, you know, what a great idea. That way. And I always, and I encourage people to contact me through my website 
and send me videos of themselves doing it. Because uh, uh, I've done that with my other records. And every once in a while, someone goes, hey, Mark, I did your thing. Can you check out my, my video? I said, love to. You know, and it's some kid in Korea or some kid in Australia. I'm like, wow, there's people in Australia or India that know me. How messed up is that? Man. You know, I'm just like a local guy from Toronto and there's people, you know, playing my music in, you know, Russia or somewhere. It's like, it's, it's wild. This global, this global place we live in now. It's, you know, the internet, it's, that's, that really made things amazing. So Man, if that's you... basically, it's going to be as everywhere you could, you would normally get yeah. music and, and check it out. So. That's awesome. If you ever truly want to be humbled, start a little drum hang podcast like I did <laughs> and then look at your right. download stats after like the first 90 days and you go, what? There are people in like Kyrgyzstan listening to my podcast. What is going that's, on here? Right. That's, that's amazing. That's it's, awesome. It's crazy. It blows my mind how far this That's community fabulous. reaches uh, every day. I like, I can't believe it. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, it's a great, you got a great title. I love the, 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 the whole the drum shuffle. It's like a great, that's a, that's a really clever title, you know? Well, again, I, I had to run that by my wife and she was like, yeah, I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> she gets all the credit, man. I just, yeah. you know, I know nothing about interviewing people. I just approach this from like the 13 year old Jamie brain of what would I want to know about all these drummers? What makes them tick? You have YouTube for, Hey Mark, what did you play in the second chorus of this tune? Right? <laughs> like, like that's yeah. covered. So I try to avoid paradiddles and ratamacues on this show and like, Hey man, where did you come from? How did you get to this point? Wow. What a great record, you know? And that's what I well, try to do. Well, let me tell you, you're a great interviewer. I think you're fantastic. I loved, I, this was, I didn't even know the time is passing. It's like five minutes, but it's been over an hour and it's like, I'm just, talking to one of my friends it's great love uh, it. man i you are talking to one of your friends for sure <laughs> um but i can't thank you enough for taking time to do it and share a little bit about the jazz exiles and this new record called the dragon's tail um it's going to be out again i'll say it october 28th so i would encourage all of you guys to go pick up a copy reach out to Mark. He's very open, very easy to talk to. Send him an email. I'm sure you would appreciate that, right? Sure. Absolutely. They, everybody can contact me through my website. Okay. Awesome. Well, Mark, I, I, I just can't thank you enough for doing this and keep me posted on everything that's going on. Um, and if you get down here stateside on a show, oh, yeah. let, let me know. I will be there if you're anywhere close um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's amazing what a community we all live in and it is global. So thanks, man. I Absolutely. appreciate it. The, 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 Jamie, the pleasure is all mine, man. Like without people like you doing what you do, you know, it, it, it would be much more of a harder struggle to get our music <laughs> out there to, to around the world. So I can't thank you enough. It's hard enough, the right? Support you're giving. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is it's hard so enough. Every little bit helps. So I thank you, you know, generously for for helping me with this. I, you know, especially someone you don't know from Canada. You, you could have gone, who's this guy? I don't know who this is, but I appreciate you uh, taking a, taking a chance. Oh I, no, it's, man! It's, it's, great. it's a great record, and I hope everybody picks up a copy. I really do. So thanks, man, and and we'll be in touch. We'll have you back real soon. Awesome. Cheers, brother. See you, man. All right, guys and girls, that is going to wrap up episode 150 of the Drum Shuffle podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening to this show. I simply cannot do it without each and every one of you continuing to do so. So I, I, I'm sincere when I thank you for listening. Uh, as I ask every single week, Hit the thumbs up, the like, the subscribe, whatever applies to the method that you use to listen into the Drum Shuffle podcast. We have some great guests coming up over the next few weeks that you're not going to want to miss. 
Uh, so please uh, hit, hit that subscribe button. That helps us more than you'll ever know. The biggest thing you can do to help our podcast is just share a link with a friend. Uh, that means the world to us. It costs you nothing and means the world to us. So uh, just send a link to somebody and say, hey, I think you'll like this podcast. That helps us more than you will ever possibly know. As always, we answer every single email that we get here at the podcast. Our email address is the drum shuffle podcast at gmail.com. Our web address is the drum shuffle.com. And as always, you can find more information on me over at jamieeds.com. So thanks once again to Mark Kelso for taking time out. Make sure you hit him up on his web address and check out Mark Kelso and the Jazz Exiles, The Dragon's Tale, when it hits a retailer near you. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers, everybody. 